good morning to all of you the professors distinguished professors students and scholars a very happy good morning to all of you this year 2015-16 we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of our research institute which was founded in 1945 in memory of professor s kuppu swami sastri who had many titles like mahamahopadhyaya kulapati and so on who was revered by all the scholars throughout the world and this institute has been doing research in many fields pertaining to sanskrit and indology and one such field is mathematics astronomy and astrology in which we have made our own little contribution and this being our 70th anniversary we have been having year long program the inaugural session was held on 29th september 2015 when the honorable governor of andhra pradesh and telangana ce esl narsimhan inaugurated our 70th anniversary at the music academy this was followed by two days seminar national seminar on tatvatraya the concept of god individual soul and the world according to different schools of indian philosophy and we had wonderful uh, sessions which was largely attended by scholars and public and the scholars were drawn from all over india and this was followed by some lectures and today we are going to start the four day workshop on ancient indian mathematics and astronomy and may i now request our respected president c t s krishnamurthy to welcome all of you and also the chief guests for today's morning c t s krishnamurthy please ah uh, very good morning to all of you as the president of the kupushwami shastri research institute i have the privilege and the honor to welcome two distinguished speakers to inaugurate the in uh, workshop on ancient indian mathematics and astronomy when they requested me to join the institute which has been adorned by distinguished people earlier i had my hesitation because i am neither qualified or distinguished myself in sanskrit or mathematics but i can only say that i have greatest respect for those people who have distinguished themselves in mathematics music and sanskrit which unfortunately i didn't have the privilege to uh, make myself very distinguished in that field be that as it may I, we are celebrating the 70th anniversary celebrations and the kuppu swami shastri institute has been organizing number of uh, seminars and workshops to commemorate this function today we have two eminent people to uh, inaug to for the inaugural function uh, dr ms rangachari uh, did intermediate and ba honors in mathematics from vivekananda college chennai he then did one year msc course in the university of madras he got his phd from the university of madras under the guidance of the well known analyst professor c t rajagopal in summability theory he then joined the ramanujam institute for advanced studies in mathematics as lecturer in mathematics in 1967 and retired as director and head of the institute in 1998 he has guided number of students for the phd degree in various topics and scores of students for the mphil degree he is deeply interested in history of indian mathematics and he has guided a few students in the top in this topic besides mathematics 
and mathematics education. He is interested in Sanskrit and Tamil languages and Vaishnavite literature and philosophy. We are indeed honored to have him. He now teaches Divya Prabandham to students at different ages. Let me also take this opportunity to introduce Dr. S.R. Srinivasavardhan. Srinivasavardhan, known often among his friends as Raghu, was born in Chennai and he received his undergraduate degree from the Presidency College in Dras. He was born in 1940, one year older than me. And he has then moved from Presidency College to Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta and was one of the famous four of the ISI, I, remember, I understand. They consist of Mr. Rangarao, Mr. Parthasarathy and Veeravalli Vardarajan. And during the period 1956-63, he received his do doctorate from ISI, Calcutta, under C. R. Mr. C. R. Rao, who arranged for Andre Kolmogorya to be present at the Vardhan's thesis defense. Since 1963, he has worked at the Qurani, Qurant, is it? Qurant Institute of Mathematical Sciences at the New York University, where he was at first, he did his postdoctoral fellowship and he was strongly recommended by Munro D. Donska. Here he met Mr. Daniel Struk, who became a close colleague and co-author of an article he has described Mr. Vardhan as, and Vardhan, whom everyone calls Raghu, came to these shows from native India in the fall of 1963. He arrived by plane at the Idlewild Airport and proceeded to Manhattan by bus. His destination was that famous institution with a modest name, the Quran Institute of Mathematical Sciences, where he had been given a postdoctoral fellowship. Mr. Vardhan was designed, was assigned to one of the many windowless offices in the Quran building, which used to be a hat factory earlier. Yet, despite the somewhat humble surroundings, from these offices flowed a remarkably large fraction of the post-war mathematics of which America is justly proud. But Mr. Vardhan is currently the professor at the Quran Institute. He is known for his work with various scholars in the institute. Vardhan is married to Vasundara Vardhan, who is also an academic in media studies in the Gandhian, in the Gallatin School of Individual Study. They have two sons, one of whom passed away in September 11 attack in 2001. His other son, Ashok, is an executive at the Goldsmith Sachs. Awards and honors have reached Dr. Vardhan on many occasions. Some of them I would like to mention for the interest of the audience. And honors include National Medal of Science 2010 from President Barack Obama, the highest honor bestowed by the United States government on scientists, engineers, and inventors. He received, he received Birkhoff Prize in 1994 the Margaret and Herman Sokol Award for the, in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, New York University, and many other uh, awards are surrounding his glory. He also has two honorary degrees from the University of University Pere de Marie Curie in Paris 2003 and from the Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. Vardhan is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and Letters. He was elected to fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Third World Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Institute of Mathematics Statistics, 1991, the Royal Society in 1998, the Indian Academy of Sciences, 2004, the Society for Industrial and, and Applied Sciences. We are indeed fortunate to have such eminent people to inaugurate this workshop on ancient Indian mathematics and astronomy, sir. May I? We have another distinguished member of the audience, Justice Ranganathan, who has adorned the Supreme Court with distinction, apart from in various fields in the Income Tax Appellate Tribunal. So we are very thankful to you for accepting our invitation and to address the inaugural function. May I say thank you once again to the audience and to the distinguished visitors for uh, 
joining the celebrations because this is going to be a four day affair and a subject which is probably not many attracting many people but I am sure it is going to be intellectually stimulating for those who are interested in the field. Thank you very much. May I now request uh, respected President C.T.S. Krishnamurthy to honor Professor M.S. Rangachari who is the Bhishma Pitamaha of Mathematics in this part of the country. Now we request C.T.S. Krishnamurthy to honor Professor Srinivasa Varadhan. Now over to Professor M.S. Rangachari, who is the president of the inaugural session of this four-day workshop. Dear friends, course for some years now, perhaps two or three years, I have been associated with the Kupu Swami Shastri Research Institute. Perhaps I am guilty of putting them in a part in which they were not so much involved, namely mathematics. It is true that the Kupu Swami Shastri Research Institute has done much to mathematics in a different way. For example, I, just now I was telling some people, there is a book published by the uh, Kupu Swami Shastri Research Institute, who, which was edited by my friend, late friend, T.S. Kupu, I mean, T.S. Kupan Shastri, which is being used, perhaps which will be used for centuries. <laughs> perhaps even the Kupu Swami Shastri Research Institute is not aware that uh, it is being used. I don't know. Anyway, they have done much for astronomy. Perhaps the tradition in our country is when it comes to Sanskrit is to study only Mimamsa Vyakarana Tarka. <laughs> and uh, I know, for example, uh, as uh, a mathematician, I know my own colleagues used to ridicule me saying that I was history, I was, I was interested in history of mathematics. Perhaps uh, there is some thinking about mainstream and all that and I don't know who decides the mainstream. I have a feeling that only time decides the mainstream. Unfortunately, the, that is not felt by our professional colleagues. They make some assessments and they decide on who is to be supported, who is not to be supported. In fact, uh, people like Professor Varadhan who are self-effacing, perhaps we have to project them. The agencies as such may not project them. <laughs> uh, much is not known about him. In fact, his uh, friend V.S. Varadharajan is better known than S.R.S. Varadhan. In fact, I know that he has done uh, very pioneering work in what is called diffusion processes. Most probably it will be, it will have more applications than representations of Lee algebras. <laughs> and uh, the history of mathematics in India is through applications. In fact, I used to say many times, for example, it starts with the cartwheel, which is done by the, of course, it, now it is not done using wood and iron. <laughs> it is all tires now rubber tires now. It used to be 
constructed in six equal parts in wood with a spoke centrally to the part and they knew also uh, the effect of heat on metal first the rim was decided and then the six equal parts were made they were juxtaposed the rim was put outside it was after heating and it was cooled using water we got the wheel they should be as old as the vedas ratha and chakra they, <laughs> they are found in the vedas because we are not aware and again possibly we are also not proud of our country proud of our contributions and to a great extent we have been philosophical we have been thinking about things have taken place somebody has done it for us maybe it is just for our good we need not bother who did it that was our attitude that was the reason why we did not project the history of mathematics in india and most probably the history of mathematics in india as with any history in of india has been written by the britishers not by the indians and there is a necessity now because of the evolution which has taken place in the whole world that we should also say something about what we have done so far in that sense for example this beja ganita pati ganita which are taken for this workshop they are perhaps the old works which in some sense i take it to be mental mathematics though they interpret this pati mathematics as uh, being done on a plate pata i have a feeling that is it comes from pat pat that is which is quickly done it might be that actually we have not specialized on it we have just uh, made the book uh, wrought in the libraries even after it was printed that was the re- reason which uh, uh, so that it was not so popular anyway uh, it is good that the kupusami shastri research institute has uh, thought about a workshop to completely expose these two texts i suppose they need to be done uh, i mean completely to the Uh, i mean letter by letter so that some glossary is uh, made out of it and becomes useful for future generations i now request to uh, professor sr was sr s vardhan to give his lecture i mean uh, keynote address for this occasion thank you thank you very much for inviting me <coughs> for this occasion i feel like an imposter here because i must admit i don't know sanskrit i grew up in the suburbs and our school did not offer sanskrit as an option so i took intensive tamil as a second option and studied more tamil literature rather than learning sanskrit but recently i became aware of contributions to mathematics from ancient uh, india and i think my first real contact was a few years ago when i was visiting cmi and a book on the kerala school of calculus was released and that's when i got thinking seriously about at least reading some material about contributions uh, from indian mathematicians of ancient times and you know one of the things people say is that the number system as we know now had its origin in india so i was curious and tried to follow the history of it a little bit and see how it's in other civilizations after all uh, india is not the only uh, country with civilization of some sort at that time there was the mayan civilization in central america there was the egyptian civilization as the chinese there is the mesopotamian civilization they all 
had something to do with mathematics. After all, you can't avoid it. Uh, first thing you want to do is you want to count. For nothing else, how many sheep do you have? How many children do you have? So everybody has to count at some point. And, you know, you don't remember everything. So once you count something, you have to write it down somewhere. And how do you write it? Well, uh, Meena knows that when we just joined statistics honors at that time, we were taking a statistics course and we were asked to create frequencies. And the way you create frequencies, you take something, put a tick mark, and four of them, fifth one you cross. And that's how you keep count. So that's the system of counting, more or less in different forms, uh, people develop. Maybe it's not crosses, but it's something else. And then slowly counting evolved from that, and various uh, societies, uh, you know, developed methods. But then, once civilization started, and you have societies with agriculture, so on, and some sort of organization, then you have to keep accounts. You have to keep track of things, and that required large numbers. Uh, to write large numbers with just the strokes is not a practical proposition. So you have to invent some things, and various civilization produced various ways of doing it. For example, I have some examples here. The Egyptians had symbols for various powers of ten. So, so if you want to write 323, they put the symbol for 103 times, and the symbol for 10 two times, and the symbol for one three times. And, and the, but that was okay, they could keep track of huge numbers that way. And how to deal with fractions, you know, and if that's what you do, then they had a way of writing fractions as a reciprocals of integers. So the only fractions they could write was 1 over 6, 1 over 7, 1 over 10, like that. And then any other fraction, they will try to write it as a sum of fractions of this type. And, you know, it's very hard to do arithmetic that way. How do you add fractions? So they had an enormous table converting one form to the other. It was a real mess. Now, different civilizations have different number systems. For example, we now use decimal, we use 10 as the base. The Sumerians and Babylonians used 60 as a base. And you can see the remnants of that still. Still hour is divided into 60 seconds. And our day in Hindu calendar is divided into 60 Narigais and then 60 Narigai to 60 Vinadis. So the, that part of the system somehow has come from there here and we have incorporated it. The Mayans had 20 as their base rather than anything else. And they also developed a zero. They had a symbol for zero which they used and mainly as a placeholder because when you write long sequences sometimes the digits have to be there is nothing to represent that digit, so you put a zero as a placeholder. And they had developed that too. But they were so isolated that uh, nobody knew about the Mayans until the Spanish went there uh, very, uh, quite a few hundred years back. The Chinese had bamboo sticks to represent numbers. They had four vertical sticks, and then the fifth one was a bar across, and they repeated that. But they never had zero. So it was very complicated for them to reach large numbers, and they had to uh, 
you know, they had to uh, invent some special symbols. And the problem with when you use special symbols and so on, arithmetic becomes difficult. You, use, you know, like in the Roman system, you can't, how do you add LX and CC? I mean, essentially you have to memorize them. Uh, so the India has developed numerals very well. They could write numbers as they pleased because they had a zero and a placeholder. So they know how to do it. And then they started developing, developing arithmetic. Okay. And the question was how to deal with zero when you are dealing with arithmetic. How do you divide by zero? And various people had various definitions about how to divide by zero. And that's only very recently that people decided that you can't do it. <laughs> and, and also the notion of infinity. The Jains had a notion of infinity. And Jains said that if you divide a number by zero, a number that's not zero by zero, the answer is infinity. But they couldn't decide what zero by zero was. And then there is Islamic art and you know the Arabs learnt about the Indian counting system and imported it into Europe and that was a big boon for the merchants in Europe because the keeping books became much more manageable with the Indian system than with the Roman system. But the Islamic art, you know, they cannot depict images in their art. So they, decide they could only use designs, geometric patterns as decoration that develop a sense of geometry. And so you see very intricate geometric patterns and in fact any possible pattern is represented in some form in Islamic art. So in some sense the mathematics you develop depends on the needs you have. And then you know eventually uh, we develop once we have the notation to write mathematics symbolically then mathematics becomes universally accessible. And, and uh, whether somebody writes mathematics in Chinese or Russian, when, it, when I see it in symbols, I understand it immediately without any need for the language. My own knowledge of history in a mathematical topic has been the history of probability I have followed fairly well uh, because that's my area. And there are some interesting facts which uh, put, how did probability develop? It's only, it's a relatively recent subject, although people must be aware of it because uh, uh, any gambler knows about probability or else he's not a gambler. Uh, uh, gambling was not unknown in India, Mahabharata is reference to gambling. So there must be, I mean, some knowledge about odds and probability and so on. But it was not really codified in any sense. Uh, there was a question, intellectual question that was raised in Italy uh, around, maybe around 1500 or something around there. And the question was this, two people play a game and they were supposed to toss a coin the coin is fair and they toss it certain number of times, say eight times and whoever gets uh, you know uh, more heads or maybe make it nine heads so that it's not even whoever gets more heads wins the whole thing so they make a pot, you give a certain amount, each contribute equally and the winner takes off so they play the game 
but they could not complete the game. At some point, maybe their kids play in the game and their parents found them out or something, they had to stop the game. And then one person is ahead a bit, the other person is behind a bit, but they have not won it yet. The question is, how do you divide the money at that point? And there's a huge discussion about it. Uh, it went on for nearly 200 years. There's a solution somebody in Italy provided. Nobody agreed with it. And finally the French decided to look at it and they said, okay, let's build a theory out of it. And that's how the probability theory developed. And in order to give a solution to that problem, and uh, then it became set and everybody realized that that was the right way to do it. One final interesting note is that that level, the probability theory, developed very quickly in France. But in Italy, in, in England, it was totally ignored. And the reason for that is very simple. Uh, England was a Protestant country and gambling was a sin. So they never did probability. Thank you. We are thankful to Professor Srinivasavardhan and also Professor Rangachari. And now, if uh, anyone of you, especially the younger generation, would like to ask them any question, they are here to answer your queries pertaining to mathematics. Please keep your questions a little bit shorter. The mathematics is very important to relate ourselves to space and time and many other things. My question is how we perceive, perceive, how else is, else is people perceive uh, various phenomena by using uh, mathematics. The question is, do we, per do we carry out the same perception in us to look, to look at things in a mathematical way as our ancestors uh, perceive? This is my fundamental question. Do we learn those mathematics in our uh, educational institutions? So, what is the advantages of learning ancient mathematics along with the modern mathematics? Is there anything that, or do we lose anything if you don't learn our ancient mathematics? Do we lose anything in our perception, interpretation, or action? This is my fundamental question. And my name is Bhupalan. I'm doing PhD in the Education Department, Madras University. You seem to think that whatever we study in college or university is very useful. More often, <laughs> they are the most useless thing which we study. When it comes to Indian mathematics, as I pointed out just now, I told you about how the cartwheel is being made. Are you aware that there is a mathematical fact behind that making of the cartwheel? It is the fact that a regular hexagon can be filled in a circuit. The side of the hexagon and the radius is circular are equal. Have you heard about it? Therefore, we don't care for it. We are rather using it. In fact, I was born in a village. It, at that time, we didn't have the decimal system of weights and all that. I remember the lady who used to come from a neighboring village to sell vegetables. She knew how much it will cost. If a VC costs so much, how much? A share will be Therefore, mathematics is part of life. Why do you think that uh, 
If somebody should find a use for it, you will find a use for it once it is known. In terms of education, what is the role of education? It's not just learning facts. Learning facts nowadays you can Google, you can see Wikipedia, you can learn the facts. The role of education is to make you think. So what you really learn is how to learn. And for that, to learn from ancient texts is as important as learning from modern texts. One aspect of Bhagavad is precision and concision. That is what is created by Bhagavad. The other subjects don't give that spirit. I had uh, studied mathematics. I was teaching mathematics, but uh, I mean, if you go by what the poster says, it is all the modern mathematics, the pure mathematics side of it. But now, I really regret why I had not done a study of ancient Indian mathematics and astronomy. I had studied modern astronomy, modern mathematics. If I have to start now, I, I would like to know how do I start, where, which are the books and which are all the 